This is the story of how the most famous dancer that England has ever produced was deceived and betrayed by those closest to her. Of how a little girl called Peggy Hookham, brought up in Shanghai, told her mother that she would one day become the greatest dancer in the world. And of how, in spite of being almost unable to walk, she was still performing when she was 67. It is a story of courage and tenacity, of unbelievable devotion to her art and to those whom she loved, who, in the end, left her penniless and alone, even to the extent that she was buried at first in a pauper's grave. It is the stuff of fiction, except that it is true. Even in my remote corner of wilderness in Canada, she was a household name. She was on everyone's tea biscuit tin and all that sort of thing. I mean, she really was. She was a big name. She was as big a name as the Prime Minister of England, if not more, you know. Um, she was up there with Churchill. <laughs> In my remote little dot on the globe. So what she must have been here and loved and adored, she was a household word, you know. She represented ballet. She was, she was ballerina. <laughs> she was, Fontaine was ballerina, that, that's ba that was ballerina. She had very bad judgment about people. She definitely had bad judgment about people. Yes, that was a, that was a weakness. And therefore, a lot of people used her, exploited her, cheated her. Uh, but I, th I think she rather liked, she didn't have very good taste in people. If you really want to know, that rather separated her and me. I couldn't quite face all the creeps. I know that she was, that she was having injections in her feet for the last few years when I was there because the arthritis was so bad. And, um, and Fred used to, you know, Margaret run across the stage and he'd say, Margaret, stop beetle crushing. Use your feet through the floor, you know, and she, it was too painful. She was like the queen. She, she represented England. She was it. She was the face of the motherland. She was a true heroine. You identified with her. I mean, as a dancer or even as a member of the audience, you, you just identified with the fact that this woman was there do, sort of doing it for you. That was the ability, that was the, that was the quality that she had, that she was dancing in your place, that if you could dance, that was what you would do and she would embody it for you. Well, she had one knee which hurt every time she um, bent it. And I only found that out because I said to her, why do you always take your curtains on that leg? So because every time I move on the other leg, it sends a shooting pain. And you'd come into the dressing room sometimes and she'd be taking off her shoes. And she'd take off the shoes and, and, and her feet were covered in blood because no matter how often you do things every now and then, if you're a dancer, your, your feet bleed. But she would always, I mean, I suppose I was privileged that she felt she could take them off when I was in the dressing room. But if other people came in and her, her stockings were spattered with blood, she would hide her feet under the table so they didn't see. Thank you.
She was an invention, really, Margot. The making of Margot is the most extraordinary thing. She was a pudgy little girl, a plump little thing, with a face and haircut. It did look a bit Chinese. She had her nose changed, and she found that there was a kind of glamour to dances that she felt that she needed. She had a very low hairline, and so when she pulled her hair back, she, she, she used to pluck the hair round her, round her forehead to take her hairline back, to give her a you know, better line. She dyed her hair. But many dancers dye their hair. That's not a... That's <laughs> Except that there was a, In those days, there was a sort of prejudice that you absolutely had to have black hair if you were going to be a dancer. She wanted a long neck, and she did achieve it. You know how she... She held her neck, her head, beautifully. It was absolutely... But if you see the pictures, she was a little girl. She didn't have a specially long neck. But she made herself into what she wanted to be. When she opened her mouth, it was dreadful. She had a nice like this. <laughs> it was really... And she, sometimes she had to talk, and they'd do an odd interview. And then she realised too, she said, my voice is terrible, isn't it? So she went and had special voice lessons. She was like a blank page. She was something that people could write on. She was like somebody in a cocoon, actually. She was like somebody coming out of chrysalis into this haunted, beautiful, um, bony face came out of this really unpromising material, almost as unpromising as her name, really. When it came to getting on stage, I also thought it was a, you know, it, uh, Hookham isn't a good stage name. And, well, uh, we changed it to, to Fontes, uh, Fontaine. Well, my maiden name was Fontes, and that was the, the nearest we could get to it. We didn't want it to be too foreign. Everybody uh, thinks that this, the, the name Fontaine is very wonderful and, and wonderfully chosen and all the rest of it. I would have to say that the facts are that it was chosen just because it came after uh, another name in a, in a telephone book. And I think it was a, a hairdresser's in the uh, Charing Cross Road who supplied the magic because when the letter came back from the Fontes family saying on no account will we let our name be besmirched by theatrical associations, um, Margot and her mother then went back to the uh, telephone directory and looked down the F's and lo and behold there was a, there was a hairdresser in the Charing Cross Road, Fontaine, and they said right that will do. 